This is Wild on 7th, your favorite wild podcast. Did you guys see this? This is unbelievable. What is that all about, Kinger? Get in here for the real thing. Like, let's get weird. Maybe I blacked out trying to figure out what was going on. Doubt, worry, fear, because that's what we're breaking the mold on here. Welcome to Wild on 7th, presented by Pilot Games. We're here until it's here. Okay. Good. All right, welcome back to Wild on 7th, your favorite wild podcast. Uh, as always, presented by Pilot Games. Um, use their products whenever you're out, um, because when you do, your community wins. And they're, they're one of the greatest donators um, to youth programs and associations. So again, Pilot Games, thank you for your sponsorship. Great show here today. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, it's maybe the the most exciting week in hockey in Minnesota. We just came off uh, two weeks ago for the Minnesota Wild, what I, I call we called Gauntlet Week because it was a set of back to backs against some good teams, and the Wild needed to make some moves. And then last week it was like Saturday at the Masters. It, it was moving day. You're looking at some people above you in the leaderboard, and you had to gain some ground, uh, or at least the Wild did. Um, unfortunately, they didn't. But heck, they they've got Sunday left. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit, but the, the big week here is the state high school hockey tournament. And we'd be remiss if we didn't have one of the icons of the state high school hockey tournament join us. Um, thank you, Lou Nanny. Uh, we could go down, we could say former NHL or general manager, um, state high school hockey. Great. I mean, you name it. I could go on here and spend can I, an hour. Can I do an intro? Yeah, I, do an intro. I really wanted to. Okay. So. Hey, everybody. Uh, Duke Cannon sponsors this interview. If your hair is a weapon or you wish it was, check them out. Here we go. We got Sweet Lou from the Sioux. This guy was a player. He was a GM. He was a coach. He's been an Olympian. He's a two-time HOF Hall of Famer, U.S. and IIHF. He sold envelopes. He has he had a steakhouse. He's got a different restaurant. He played in the USHL and the Rochester Mustangs and he lives life the right way, and he's the godfather of the state tournament, Mr. Lou Nanny. Oh, God, thank that you. That was pretty thank solid. You. That's pretty thank nice. You, thank you. That means I'm old when you start using those words. Oh, baby, you're doing good. You're doing good. Before we get started, I'm going to tell you one thing, because I'm, I'm looking at your sponsors here, and I haven't been in this room before. And if you want to raise money, what you have to do is when Wilder are having these auctions, you have to auction off a few four or five chairs or something to somebody to come and watch. And they'll pay a lot of money to come and see this podcast being delivered. And I really think that they would enjoy it. This is, this is much nicer than I thought, and I thought it was pretty nice before I got here. So I'm telling you, use your assets because you got some good ones right here. Lou, what, uh, what oh, I'd have yeah. to say in return to that is uh, they'd probably pay a lot of money to see you here with us. <laughs> no. <laughs> so no. If, that's, no. Uh, if you're willing to stop by quarterly, yeah, yeah. we will sell those. If I'm in town, I'll d- definitely do it, but you guys do a great <laughs> job. I love watching this podcast. Thank that's you. That's very nice. Thank you. Yeah. We were talking about this off the air. What are you doing staying up this late? Because it's after the wild games. Well, I stay up. Uh, I don't sleep that. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't require a lot of sleep, so... It's very, very unusual if I go to bed before 11.30 at night. And so uh, and, and many times it's past that. But it's easy for me to stay up after for a while game and after the game. I, I, I like to hear everything that's going on. And then when I see the shows that are going to be on, they're interesting, I enjoy it. So it, I'm, I've got the good fortune of being able to catch all this stuff. Is any of that because you like to train the body to be able to stay up late enough in case White Bear Lake and Grand Rapids go to double overtime in the 8.30 <laughs> game, the that, first game of the that, state tournament? That's a good question because, you know, that's one thing that drives me nuts about the state high school tournament that I, I always tell people, especially Tommy Reed, he, when, even though, when you guys are on the road and he's looking back and seeing there might be a game going in overtime, he says, you got it again. Like, because I always say, I don't get paid for overtime. <laughs> I, I get paid for just a regular game. But uh, when we had that fifth, uh, five overtimes at Apple Valley in Duluth, at the end of the four overtimes, the guy says, well, I, I hope that this... Uh, this is a good goal that goes in. I said, I don't care if they throw it and kick it in. I just want to go home. I <laughs> just, it's a you know really a, a long day for me, especially the first day. I, I'm there by eight thirty, nine o'clock in the morning, and don't get home till midnight or a little after that. And uh, then you got the next two nights the same thing or late. So I I, uh, I like to see earlier games, and I certainly don't like to see overtime. 
That's funny. So let's get into that because that 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 first day, actually, the tournament in general is so hard. So I've I've broadcast the games on Hockey Day, and we have two two games, four teams that you have to kind of figure out. You got to talk to the coaches, you got to know the players, the storylines, and each one takes a considerable amount of time to figure out the teams, the stories, the the players. I mean, how are you doing it for a state hockey tournament? Like, and then all of a sudden, at the end of that day, how are you not just absolutely fried? Well, actually, it's four games. I do all, all four games. Yeah. It's eight teams. And the unusual part is now I'm fortunate. I, when I first started doing this at the uh, St. Paul uh, Civic Center there, I used to do all the interviews. I might have 57 interviews in a day, and I'd be running up and down from the stairs because the elevators were not very good to take. I wouldn't get there in time. I would do all the interviews. I'd do all in between periods, in between games, and then I would do the games. And I want to tell you, when I had my first draft, and I, I think all the drafts were like that when I was general manager, I'd be up all night trying to make deals, shoving full scaps under the general manager's doors that are sleeping or something, you know, the deals. And when the end of the three days was over for that, for that um, draft, I used to want to come home and just go to a hotel and sleep for the day because I, I had no sleep. I right. basically had no sleep. And it's the same thing with the state tournament because – even though I'll get home late and I'll be up late and I'll be a little hyper so I won't go right to bed, I'll be back up at 6, 6.30 in the morning. So the end of three days, like I said, I can't wait till it's over because then I'm going on vacation <laughs> next week for a few days because it does it does take a lot out of me, especially now that I'm older. Hey, Louis, I, you know, I remember when George Clooney sold his tequila brand. My, my wife said, George Clooney's good at life. And I feel the same way about you. You're getting holes in one. You're traveling. I'm just curious, non-hockey, what what would you say? Like, what are some tips to, if you could talk to your younger self or you're talking to somebody, just say, hey, man, this, this, is, some, this is the way to do it, whether it's travel or golf. What would be some of your tips for living a, a, a full life? Well, first off, uh, I say there's no saddlebags on a casket. So, <laughs> you know, don't be afraid to do what you want to do. But... Uh, you have to take time in, in my sphere of things. It's uh, my family first, and I, I like to always have our family around a few times a year, everybody, and we, you know, we're up to 38, 39 now. That's why I have a big place in the lake, so everybody can come at least three times a year, but they can come whenever they want, but I want them there at least three times a year to keep the family together. And then do things that you want to do. Enjoy yourself and don't worry about uh, other things that might obscure your, your vision of what you really want to be. You, it's like playing hockey. You know this, Ryan. When you go out on the ice, if you're thinking about making a mistake, you're going to make a mistake because everybody makes mistakes. Michael Jordan, you know, before he won the game uh, scoring basket years ago, he had missed six in a row, and he, and he gets it right at the buzzer. He scores the winner. He's not afraid to take a chance, so... When I'm talking to people, I, I say to them, you have to enjoy life. And if you have any doubts or something, look in the mirror and talk to yourself about what your assets are because your ability is your security. And when you realize that you can do that because of the things like you were in hockey, now hockey's over. you got to do something else. So you're doing something else. You're able to do a great job in the broadcast. you working for the wild. You guys have things that you've wanted to do, your, your broadcast. You have to take the chance because there are no return trips. And you have to really do what you like. When you like what you do, I, I, I still work. I still work for RBC Global Asset Management, and I travel a lot. But, you know, I really feel like I, 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 I don't have a job because I'm doing what I like. The, you could do certain things, I feel like, in life and, and chase these dreams, but at the same time, you need opportunity. And you were able to get some pretty sweet opportunities. You know, you go from playing right into general manager the next year. Into, Not the next year. After one game, I was after, in New York. And yeah. Came home and took over everything. <laughs> right. And then it's into the broadcast booth. It's the state high school hockey tournament. It's this and that. Uh, how, how, if you're talking to kids, uh, how do you – how? How do they get opportunities? Like, what was it about you that, that provided these opportunities to you and then the willingness to take them? I think it was the hunger to make certain I took care of my family because <clears throat> when you talk about opportunities and all the things I've done, I'll just tell you, just imagine here I come out of college and I was fortunate enough to win every award they have in college, even 
the scoring as a defenseman, which was never done before. And so I was in good bargaining position. So I agreed to terms with the Chicago Blackhawks in May. But I'd got married the year before. And now uh, I graduate. And now my daughter's born. And, and so I, Francine and I had no money. So I got to go to work. I graduated on Friday. I went to work on a Monday to figure, and I'm going to work for three months and turn pro because I already have the contract agreed to. Comes to time to go to camp. They send the letter for camp, but they didn't send the contract. And I called up Mr. Ivan. I said, you forgot the contract. He says, well, you could sign it when you're here. I said, no, 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 no. I don't come without a contract. We've already agreed. He said, well, Bobby Hull doesn't come without a contract. Uh, I mean, Bobby Hull comes without a contract. I said, I really don't care about Bobby Hull. He hasn't got a wife, a child, and a college degree, and a job. I do. So he said, you won't play. I said, then I won't play. I sat out five years before I turned pro. In that five years, so I started broadcasting uh, for a little station at St. Louis Park High School games. I, Mariucci wanted me to coach a freshman. He changed the time so I can coach a freshman. So I'm working, coaching a freshman, broadcasting. I played in the weekends in Rochester to make 30 bucks a game. And then, uh, then he asked me to do the TV to state tournament. So I was doing all these things before I turned pro. When the Wild came here, now I had the chance to because they, Chicago couldn't hold me anymore. They did for five years, preventing me from signing with anybody else. So I had the opportunity. I'm a free agent. But they put a bill through Congress so I can become an American to play with the Olympic team. So I, I didn't want to sign with the Wild right away. So I'm playing with the Olympic team. So they gave me, I, I bought season tickets for the Wild. I'm watching the games. After the game, I go down and do the scoreboard show, the TV show. And then I'm playing with the Olympic team and I'm working for Harvey McKay. So when it's all over, I came back and now I'm a free agent. But my first contract, no one's ever signed one like this before or after. I went in and I said, uh, you know, we're, we battled for three weeks. What I want, we can't pay you this enough. I said, I'll find a way for you to pay me. I'll give it to you. They said, what's that? I signed a personal service contract, which meant I got paid to play hockey. I said, you don't have a hockey school. I'll start the North Star Hockey School and oversee it. I said, any appearance that players don't make, I'll do for nothing. And you sell my services in the summer to anybody you want, and I'll go sell for them, and you keep the money. So I did that for three years. They were able to make the money. And in three years, I did all those things for myself on top of it. So I was getting myself ready to... I always thought that I'm going back to work. I'll play three years, I'll go back to work. So I... I always want myself prepared to go back to work. Mm -hmm. and, and I was doing all these different things that evolved into all these different jobs. Broadcast stayed the same. I was vice president of the Players Association for seven years. They, they, the, <clears throat> the North Stars, pay, in those days, you had to pay part of your pension. They paid my pension if I wouldn't be player rep. So for three years, I couldn't be player rep, but they paid my pension. Then when you had to pay, my pension was, it was paid for, I became the vice president and so I, I stayed on that right through 91 i was still broadcasting and in fact when i when i be finished broadcast was playing the season if we didn't make the playoffs we lost out early hockey night in canada used to hear I me and i'd go up there and do those games so all the things i did were all from a foundation that i had when i was out of hockey getting me ready just to work and seeing what i wanted to do and i just figured i'll do whatever i can do to provide for my family Awesome. That's great. That You almost did the uh, what players struggle with after they retire. You got to do almost before your career started. That's, you kind of loaded. That's a good way to put it. You're right. You yeah. like had a gap year, basically, yeah. a gap three years. Hey, what do you think? Do we put the legend through rapid fire? Just, that's what I was just digging I just want to do it. Cause, so, Louie, we're going to – we do this with all the wild players, and you're a, you're a double Hall of Famer. You can handle this. So this is very simple. It's called rapid fire. Unless you're a goalie, then you do it really slow. <laughs> so we ask you, we're going we're gonna to alternate. So, and if you don't have an answer right away, just say pass, and mm -hmm. we're going to go back and forth, mm -hmm. and we're just going to pepper you. This is how we kind of open you up and get to know you a little better and the listener too. So I'll start. Nickname? Sweet Lou. Who do you text the most? Besides your wife, probably. Well, it'd be work. I, I, my assistant, because she handles all my schedule. <laughs> uh, what do you listen to in the car? I listen to this uh, serious radio, 50s and 60s. You have any pet peeves? Uh, not really, no. This is probably a trick one. Podcasters. It's, it's your birthday. Where are you going to dinner? 
Tavern 23. <laughs> <laughs> no free ads. No. <laughs> first real job. Well, the first real job was what uh, I was working for Archer Daniels Midland as a chemical sales trainee. All right, so you're. This is the the classic green light as an NHLer. So you've just won a big game, and the coach says, "Go get loose, have a night on the town." What city do you want that to be in? Montreal. Okay. What's your go-to drink at the bar? Manhattan. Outstanding. Hockey jersey you had as a kid? Gordy Howe. You're very active on that Twitter machine. It's now called X. But who is your favorite like social follow? Like whose whose comments you like to see on social? I like Russo's. <laughs> <laughs> He's active as yeah, well. Yeah, I'm not that active. I, I, hey, I read a lot. Hey, can we cut that out? Hus, cut that out. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, pre-game meal. You know, I, when my day, we always had steak, and I can tell you a funny story about that, but I always had steak and mashed potatoes. Okay. Uh, your Netflix account or your, your logins for television, mm -hmm. how many of the 39 in the family are, are on your account? I'd like to know because my account is very big and I know a lot of them know the thing and, and there are a number of them on there. That's is, funny when I'm in, in Florida, I'm getting all these other bills. <laughs> is there a right. chance that Vinny Letary uses grandpa's login for Netflix? Yes, he probably does as well. I know his parents do. <laughs> uh, perfect weekend, what are you doing? Uh, actually, I, I it used to be playing golf. Now it's just... Uh, I, I, if I had the opportunity, I would boat, but I don't do that anymore because I, I sold my boat there. So I just be uh, basically going for lunch, or uh, for me, it's at the cabin, usually just relaxing and and uh, hanging around, going into town, stuff like that. Love it. Go to snack after, uh, I suppose after the wild game when the wife goes to bed, nobody's watching. Ham and cheese sandwich. Do you have a hidden talent? And not really. I, I I don't have much talent. I just, I just work. They're just not hidden. No. A gift card from any store. So somebody gives you a card, you know you're going to actually use it. Well, I, I'd like to say it's not any store, it's any restaurant. Okay, what would it be? I, well, if it's in town here, Bar La Grassa. Okay. How about, uh, what's the last thing you binged watched? Like you watched a television oh. show, a lot of it, or a movie or something? Well, I'm still binging on Suits, but I've watched so many of them that Griselda was right before that. I, I, I mean, I've had all the big ones that you could You're think talking. of. Yellowstone, Ozark, you know. You're talking my language, man. Yeah. Those are some good ones. You like Harvey Specter? Yeah, I do, yeah. He never changes. No, That's why he's no. great. Yeah. Um, buying clothes, where do you go? Well, in town, I, uh, you know, I... I now I'd go to Martin Patrick. I yep. used to always go to Bellison's in Edina, which is not there anymore. They used to really clothe me for the state tournament. I was at the Wild. You were crazy. debonair? Yeah, well, I was more than debonair. <laughs> I was, I was uh, flashy. <laughs> what's, your, what's your favorite holiday? Uh, it's uh, Christmas because we always have uh, the family. It's been a tradition come over, and my wife makes the bolognese, uh, bucatini, and Everybody's there, and it's just, uh, it's my favorite favorite holiday of the year. And who plays you in the movie? So an actor. It's oh, a life yeah, story yeah, of Lou yeah. Nanny. Now, you can be, it can be young Lou. It can be um, middle Lou. It can be baby Lou. Who, who do you want? Well, when uh, when you're putting a miracle together, and Herb came to ask me to, if I would agree to sign to do this movie, and uh, after some negotiation, because I didn't like the way we were starting, I says, who's playing you? He says, Kurt Russell. I said, Kurt Russell, I want Brad Pitt to play me. <laughs> so I'd have to say Brad Pitt. Yeah, he's a stud. Hey, Kinger, we're spending some great time with the legend, but we've got to get these words in from our sponsor. Why don't you give us one here from, from our friends? Yeah, well, Carts, you know, I don't know if you saw, it's ice out in White Bear Lake. There was a guy paddle boarding, and what that means is you might not think so, but it's actually coleslaw season. You might want to call it cold slaw season, but it's actually coleslaw season. If you're going to do it, do Jimmy's, get the original, get the pineapple, nothing better. Put it on a burger, put it next to your baked beans, get those textures and those different temperatures. Jimmy's, Minnesota company, don't you be messing with my dressing. 
How about you? Uh, is, are you building anything in your life? <laughs> yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, I, I'm building. No, I'm not. Uh, but I did get a roof repaired last year because I was in one of those areas affected by storm damage. And um, fun little fact, it does take up to 12 months for damage to show up on your roof. And winters are harsh in Minnesota. No roofer is going to jump on and check it out. But there is damage that shows up. So, hey, go to wildconstructionmn.com. Check out their retail, or, or I should say their uh, resources on their website. If you're in one of those areas, give them a call. They'll send somebody out, get up on that roof, see if some of that damage has shown up over winter, uh, and then you can maybe sleep easy with a, a new roof. So wildconstructionmn.com. Check them out. Good work. Carts is nothing like sitting here with uh, Sweet Lou from the Sioux, but uh, we got to pay the bill, so... Uh, I'm firing one tape to tape to you right now. Thank you. That was back door, right in the back of the net. And you know what we could use here on the podcast right now is some incredible water. Uh, and our friends at Aquarius Home Services could provide that. It's time to gear up for an incredible 2024 with Aquarius Home Services. Elevate your water quality with Kinetico, the ultimate water treatment system. Experience purified water with zero payment until 2025. Bid farewell to spotty dishes and rust stains and hello to softer hair and skin. Plus, marvel at the minimal salt usage. Act fast because this offer ends at month's end. And that's not all. It's also the perfect time to upgrade your HVAC system. System. Dive into comfort with a new high-efficiency heating and cooling system and pay nothing until next year. Act now. Financing offers are subject to credit approval. Trust Aquarius to keep you cozy and delighted all year long. Financing offers are subject to credit approval. Aquarius believes in earning the right to be recommended. They're just a click away at AquariusHomeServices.com. Well, what a treat for Louis to get us to watch us do this. I mean, he's in the Hall of Fame. We should be in the live read Hall of Fame. And we got another one, Cub. Cub is, I know that Louis loves PJ Fleck. If you look real closely at PJ Fleck's headset, it's a Cub headset. They love sports. They sponsor Wild on 7th. They sponsor uh, the Homer Hankey for the Twins. They're one of us. They're awesome. They're Cub. They sell uh, alcohol at the, the grocery stores connected to the liquor stores, and they do delivery at Cub.com. So check out Cub, your neighborhood grocery store. Thank you for sponsoring Wild on 7th. Well, that you did. You nailed, by the way, yeah. great job on rapid fire. I mean, we've had, we've had NHLers just get all jammed up doing that. You were, you were smooth and silky. <laughs> Maybe I got a lot of things in my head. <laughs> I'll do one. I, this is just kind of, so you were talking about this Italian dinner, Christmas, this mm. the homemade sauce, the family. So we got a line right now, Lucini, Letteri. Yeah. And then Shaw. Yeah. <laughs> so if we had to add someone to this line, we love Mason Shaw, but what do you think? Would you go Fantilli, Marcelli is on Mary Arizona, or maybe even Celebrini coming up? Lucini, Letteri, Yeah, but you Fantilli. got Felino right here. You just That's right. Felino. God, I totally <laughs> slept on Moose. Yeah. That's yeah. the right answer, yeah. by the way. So, yeah, we, then it becomes the Spumoni line. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> right? And we just, we just live free. And I do like Spumoni. <laughs> All right, cards, you go. <laughs> I'm just, sorry, that's what's in my notebook. <laughs> so 60 state high school hockey tournaments, one stand out as the best. Yeah, easily the Apple Valley, uh, Duluth East game, the five overtime game. Not so much because it was five overtimes, but if you ever go watch them, that game again, I've never seen a game in overtime that, that's, first of all, I had so many overtimes, but where there was just no idea of playing defense anymore. I, I couldn't believe the quality chances each team was getting and not scoring goals. It's like these teams just forgot about playing defense. They would just let the team, other team come down, have clear shots, good shots. Goalies were making great saves. They had like 67 saves, 62 saves. And, and to watch that all night long, I, I mean, that was amazing. But a couple of years ago, Maple Grove and Andover, what a game that was. That was a tremendous game. I, I, that's another one of my favorites. I think the time that uh, um, Eden Prairie won the state tournament, Ralph scored an overtime on his stomach. Mm -hmm. I mean, you remember that? There, there are some great ones. And then, of course, the best games for me, the toughest games I've ever had to broadcast were when my family, my, my son Marty played and got the winning goal in 84. And then his sons, Louis, won it uh, one year, and Tyler, I think, won it twice. So whenever, whenever 
you're broadcasting your family. It's it's an emotion you can never ever experience doing anything else. It's just like when Le, Vinny Le Terry got called up and I was doing a game in Long Island, and I'm glad that I got to do a game of his because he never made the state tournament when he was playing in high school. But you have to really prevent yourself from getting caught up in what your kids or grandkids are doing sure. to watch a plane deliver in a professional manager and neutral and and being biased. But as you're doing that outside, insights are churning. You're just dying. It's just that, you know, I've, like I said, I've broadcast everything, Stanley Cups, the Olympics, ESPN, the college finals, the state tournament. Nothing affects you like those games. I, I, I enjoyed having them and I, I, I didn't, I didn't enjoy the experience. I mean, I was happy it was over. What, what like, uh, over the course of 60 years, how has the state high school hockey tournament changed? You know, it's a, it's a big deal. Everybody buys their tickets. The venue changed from, um, you know, the Civic Center or wherever to the XL Energy Center. Um, like, what, are we in the glory days of the state high school hockey tournament? Was it 20 years ago? Like, what's the state of the high school hockey tournament? Well, it's like any sports. Uh, every sport, I don't care what you're looking at, the athletes got bigger, stronger, faster, and so the games are better, right? When you look at the games we're watching now, you, you, there's nothing comes close to it in the past because when I started doing it, they might have one line, two defensemen, they're any good, the periods are 12 minutes long, and you had really some very – Tremendous players like Timmy Shee, you, you know, he was a standout back in the 65, whatever it was. But as you progress to look at the teams now when they're coming out, now they got three great lines, maybe even four, and they got six defensemen. The goaltenders are way better. The overall games are better. The talent is unbelievable to watch those games, how these kids can play now. So as much as the other games in the past, people enjoyed them as much because they didn't know anything different. Now you have to say it's even more of an experience. You look, the bands were always there, but the bands are better, they're bigger, the, the crowd's there, the enthusiasm, the stadium is bigger. And and you, you've you got the adrenaline rush, and, and you also have, you have more of an understanding of the teams in the tournament because for some reason or other... The, the hockey base has grown, but so has the, the interest base mm-hmm. as far as the parents. So when when I was first starting this, parents might go watch their kids play every now and then. Not as often. Now they're so involved that, you know, it's it's unbelievable how much involved the parents are. So when you got that passion in the stadium and you got these kids playing with all the enthusiasm, I mean, there's electricity in the building. Right. And it, it can't be any better except it's going to go to a different level of talent as we go along. So it continues to get better and better, better and better, and better, yeah. and better. Well, that's great for the, the state of the high school hockey tournament and where, where it's going to continue to go. This tournament looks fun because it's gettable. Some of the big dogs, the one game yeah, this play-ins, is- so to speak, uh, it it. It's fun, man. I mean, Minnetonka looked like they were just going to run away with the tournament. Now they don't even have a they don't even have a spot. You yeah, know, like it's, well, uh, Minnetonka, you don't forget that Chan Essen took them to the, to the overtime earlier in the year, so it wasn't a surprise for Chan Essen. They they went in thinking that they could win and they could win. And and any time you go in a state tournament, all you got to ask yourself is who can win. And you could say anybody because we had a miracle on ice, which means. One game playoffs, anybody can win, and we've yeah. seen anybody win these one game playoffs. Yeah. We've seen big upsets, and you're going to continue to see upsets. I think you'll see upsets in this tournament. I don't know who it's going to be, but it just seems some year, every year, some different team comes and pulls it out of hat. So, two more questions on the state high school hockey tournament for uh, John gets to bend your ear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of them is. So Brian Burke says this about the the 2007 uh, Anaheim Ducks, isn't that he would put that team up against any team that has won a Stanley Cup ever? Like uh, that that was maybe the best team that's ever won, and he I think he truly believes that. In your eyes, what was the best team that's ever come through the state high school hockey tournament? Oh, you know Jefferson had a really good run. He had three, four years. That was a great team. Like in the nineties, kind of nineties. Yeah, that was good. Mark Parrish, shout but out. I, yeah, but like I want Crowley. Yeah, Crowley, uh, Climber. They had uh, yeah, you know, really good. Yep. But I want to tell you, they'd get beat today, just like Brian Brooks. Yeah. 
I yeah. don't agree with him. He well, yeah. get beat. If he thinks that team was good, it's, you, it's you, you, you want to go back to the team, go back to 78 when Montreal Canadiens lost eight games when every one of the defensemen almost was in the Hall of Fame and you got Lafleur up front and you got Belleville and you got Richard. And, uh-uh. You know, you think that that team would be better and I think that, you know, Montreal then anybody, it's the best team I've ever seen. These guys today are still more talented, yeah. they're faster, they're bigger, they're stronger. It just, and, and on top of it, the goaltending is better. Yeah. The goaltenders are almost like cheaters now. They, their equipment is three times the size it used to be. They, 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 you can't touch them. You can't do anything you used to be able to do to goaltenders before. They're like pretty. They're like in a glass case. I mean, yeah, the quarterback. It, it drives me nuts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so different. And, and then they're bigger and they're quicker and they're more agile. It's tough to score goals right now. And then the last one, who's been, in your opinion, the most dominant player that's played? Maybe it was Sheehy, who you already mentioned, but is there a player where you're like, wow, this guy, I mean, they were going to win the state tournament because this guy was just that good. Well, you know, there's been so much. She was dominant then, but Boucher was dominant. I, I want to tell you, uh, Ryan McDonough did a job when Creed won that, that championship. He was dominant. Paul Martin was dominant. Mm-hmm. There, you know, Zamolak was Dominic for Rochester. There's so many. Uh, Housley was Dominic. Neil Broughton, it, the whole line was Dominic. You know, they were unbelievable. I, it, it, th- there's just different eras where the dominance was there, and and it doesn't change for other eras because there's dominance in those areas as well. It just seems that we get some guys that, uh, you know, they they've had outstanding tournaments. So. I, I I think it's it's so tough to to match up team against team of other eras or player against player of right. other eras. How about this year? Let's let's do it. So just a couple early thoughts, right? We Ryan and I are both happy because our White Bear Lake squad is in there. We're really trying to get. It would be nice before you retire that we could get a White Bear victory in the first round. If yeah. you could maybe give us you a had party. one. Uh, they had one. Uh, I remember the Mariner. Good, yeah, yeah. Yep. No, so, but White Bear was good too. I mean, you remember Scotty Buchanan played for me in uh, in the freshman team. He was a good player. They had good teams in those times. And, you know, Billy Butters uh, played in good teams. Or they they've had some. Yeah, Brian you, Bowen. You, yeah, you guys had some good teams. It's just it's funny how you get to that first round and all of a sudden you get beat. That's what I couldn't understand. Yeah, Nineteen I mean, in a row. So many. Yeah. Well, who's counting? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you. Yeah. <laughs> so we just need that as a parting gift, and then I'm just curious, just uh. I told you I'm kind of intrigued by Centennial. There's just a little junkyard dog there. They're like just north enough, some bullets in the meat. Like I'm, I, they scare me. You know, they won the football title this year, beat Nedina, and it's like no one looks at Centennial, and then they just get you. I'm just curious, who are some of your sleepers? Who, who do you have your eye on in the tournament this well, year? Well, first of all, when you mentioned dominant player, how about the Centennial goaltender who got three shutouts in a row? Yep, and, they, and when they won the state tournament, and how about Dave Spear, who scores yeah, a hat trick in, in every game? game. <laughs> you know, yeah. so we see so many things. But uh, I, I still think that you got to worry about Chan Hassan. You know, it's coming in. Yep, they've been a good team all year long. They they felt that they should be number one. He Dino always plays well, but I Centennial is somebody you got to look at, and and uh, I uh, White Bears had a tough schedule, and yet you know they used to lose the games that they won near the end against Hill Murray. And now they're winning the game. Mm-hmm. I, I think they got a lot of belief in themselves, and they got a great player there in Root. So, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, you know, it, it, we're going to be surprised if like, Rochester, and they call themselves John Marshall Century, and so you got a, a lot of yeah, names Good luck there. with that. Yeah. You might have to go but, initials. But, I mean, they surprised Lakeville, but I don't think they're going to be coming and surprising anybody else. Elk River... They surprised, and you never know. But Grand Rapids is somebody that they always seem to rise to the occasion. I've loved the history of Grand Rapids. I love what, you know, you get these northern schools in there. They're battle-tested, and, and the, you'd think that they would come in awe of the big tournament, yeah. that, but they don't. They're, they're just used to taking care of business. And so uh, Grand Rapids could surprise Thursday night, man, I can't even believe they slotted White Bear Lake that late. There's going to be paddy yeah. wagons on the street. <laughs> the, two, the two orange and black squads, the Northerners and the White Bear at eight, man, Louie, yeah. it is going to be raucous at that game. There'll be some uh, early, some late arrivals. Yeah. <laughs> what, what are you going to miss the most uh, about calling the games? I, I guess the, the, 
the surprises that I've seen in the tournament, the enthusiasm of these kids. It, it's just an unbridled enthusiasm that you just feel it in, in the building. I just, uh, I, I just really like to see the surprises that I've seen over years because you never expected this to happen or that to happen, and, and you get it. I won't miss the long hours, <laughs> you know. And uh, and the funny thing is, you know, I, I people might say, "Oh, you 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 live in Edina, you cheer for Edina." I got to tell you, I really don't have any favorites except when my family played. If you don't think I'm cheering for my family, you're crazy. <laughs> but outside of that, I don't care who wins. I just sure. basically, I, I have to tell you this: I really like the best team to win. Yeah. I don't like the, the, the underdog winning for one reason. I grew up in Sault Ste. Marie, and we never lost. We had, you know, six guys in my my team essentially uh, playing in the NHL from a little town like that at one time. And we go play in the championship outside of the Sioux, and we could see 3,500 people in the building. 500 would be cheering for us because we were the all-Italian squad, essentially. Chico Mackey, his name ended on I, so I said we let him be Italian, you know, but... But like Ronnie Francis came after me, his mother's Italian. We had this deal. We we never lost. And then when we go play the teams from out of town, the whole town would be cheering against us because we always won. I mean, they're our town. We're Sault Ste. Marie. The other guys might be Oshawa or Sudbury or Spanish or Timmins, and they want them to win. I, I, that's why it used to bother me so much that people would be against us. So now... I know how the people hate good teams. So you root for them. So I root for them. You're the good if team's ally. The, yeah, well, if they're the best, yeah. <laughs> if they're the buddy. best, get in there. You know, yep. If they get beat, then I'm happy for the team to beat them. But I, I, I like good teams to be successful because they were good. You seem to also be wise financially, and uh, that's just placing your bet where the odds are the best, right? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, let's, uh, should we get into the wild a little bit here? Yeah. So what do you think? Where's what in your opinion? You now you watch a lot of the wild games. And, yeah, I watch them all because I do the radio show in KFAN. Right, and uh, what? Where's the state of the team? What, where do you think they're at? Because, and I'll elaborate a little bit on this. So you, we had the team that started slow. Coaching changed. Needed a shot in the arm. Then they were good for a little while, and now we're starting to see some up and down hockey. So it's. Uh, I think we're still trying to figure out, like, which team the Wild is this year. I mean, what have you seen? Well, which team it is is a team that's been injured for yeah. far too much. When you look at the man games missed, you, you can't expect to replace three, four, five players, especially when they're your top players or your top seven. Guys can come in and play for a game or two or three, but that's it. If if they were as good as those other guys, they'd have been they'd there. They'd be there, yeah. So you, you can't expect to suffer those kind of long-term injuries and reach the level you can be at because you just, you, you don't have the same team. It's not an expectation that's real. And I, I, one thing about the Wild to start with, they always compete. Mm-hmm. When anybody goes to pay their money to go see the Wild, they're going to see effort. You might not see wins, they're going to see effort. And when people get upset, you, you know, when, when we weren't very good at the NHL, uh, a couple of years, and and people call and, and get upset with me. I say, if you don't like our team, watch the other team. But I said, I want to ask you one question. Do you go to movies? They said, Yeah. Do you really enjoy movies? Yeah. I said, Well, there's only one Academy Award winner, but you're going to movies. You're seeing other right. things. So it's just like that in hockey. You come see the game. You might be seen not seeing the Stanley Cup winner, but you're enjoying. If you enjoy hockey, come and watch it. But but the wild. You know, the hours are going to give you a good show. Now, can they win with just a good show? Sometimes they can't. They've, they've had some uh, games where they haven't played well, and their goaltending hasn't been as good overall this year as last mm-hmm. year. And they've given good efforts. But if you if you look at the consistent goaltending in the league, you're going to have to get that, too, to, to be at the top. We're talking about being a top team. And they've given good efforts along the way, but... They can't expect to give as good an effort when their defense isn't as good as the defense they were going to have in front of them. So you can't blame it on the goaltenders. And you can't blame it on the defense that's there. You got three of them out, four of them out sometimes. I I can't believe how you expect to compete at the same level. So you're not seeing a true picture of this team because they haven't been this team all year long. They, They have had a very, very bad run of injuries. 
that is really unusual. Now let's talk uh, like the state of the game of hockey and like competitive advantages. And um, I'll go on a short little filibuster here. So it, it used to be, you know, you'd have your two scoring lines, your checking line, your energy line, and then that's kind of changed over time. I think you know Tampa started to change that a little bit. Boston, where you'd go like, hey, we need kind of three, four scoring lines, so to speak, and um, and the competitive advantage started to change. You know, it, it was a race to three goals, and then you could shut it down defensively. Now it seems like it's a it's a race to four goals. There's just more offense. It's harder to defend. Um, where is the competitive advantage? Because we saw, I think we saw the Wild a couple years ago, um, double down on physicality, and, and that's still a part. And you look at New York and Rampy and what he's doing there, and the fact that that still influences the game and the way that people play and respond. Um, but the Wild lose guys like Maroon and Felino. And you start to see guys like Vinny all of a sudden get some more minutes, some chances, and the way that they can skate and play with the puck, and it kind of changed the dynamic of the team a little bit. So overall, like, what, what's what's your read on the way that the game is kind of changing, evolving, and where the competitive advantages are? Well, you, you have to have the flexibility on on your – let's take the forwards first – on your forward line of, of interchanging players. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest – Successes Montreal used to have is Scotty Bowman. You never knew who he's going to come up with. You, you, you might have a set lineup that you're used to seeing, but during the game, it all changes. And and to get away from checkers to right. maybe get freedom. So you're you're forward. You can't say that okay, this is just going to be a checking line because that line's going to have to maybe they, they got to come up with some goals sometime. Right. You know, and 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 more than that, you might have to break them up. Because you might want to check a player. It used to be you you, you check a, a, a forward line with a checking line. Then it drifted away, and now it comes more often that your best defenseman will be against the, the forward line that scores, mm -hmm. and they don't worry about what line they're playing against right. them. And so if you're not worried about what, what line they're playing against them, then you're able to interchange some of the guys. And you see Heinz doing, especially when they they go 11-7, to seven, but... Even when they're not doing that, he, he's interchanged lines. That's how Boldy and Erickson Eck ended up with Kaprizov now. Right. You, you, you've you just got to – it's not a, a thing that I think you could set up. I, I think it's a nightly thing yeah. that I I think a coach has got to have a feel. If somebody's going and not going, yeah. don't be afraid to change them during the game. Make right. make changes because you're, what you're trying to do is not get the other team off balance. You're trying to get your team on balance right. to, to perform. And so that I – I think that uh, I see more static line combinations mm -hmm. now than I've, I've ever seen. And I think that people should have the freedom, the coaches should be ready to, to interchange more often. Coaches do seem more willing to let lines work their way through their yeah. struggles yeah. versus give them a shot in the arm or spark them with changing something. Yeah, we, we never had that. I mean, if you weren't playing, it, <laughs> yeah. you might be with somebody else or you might not even be yeah. playing. You yeah. probably didn't have uh, X number of year deals with no movement clauses either. That right? kills me. That <laughs> Ryan, I have to tell you, I never, when I was a general manager, the only one-way contract I signed was Bobby Smith, the first guy I signed, because... He was coming out, and the WJ was coming in, and so we were bidding against Hartford, so a two-way was never going to get it. In all the years I was general manager, I never had a guy on a one-way contract, and that includes Neil Broughton, Brian Bellows, Craig Hartsburg, anybody you want to name. And and they say, well, what are you saying? I'm not taking this. I said, why? You're not going to go through waivers with that because somebody's going to, if you've got a $25,000 minor league clause, somebody's going to pick you up. Right. But... Now these no movement clauses, I would, I'm different. I just I would shy away from that a lot, or at least I'd cut them back, and I'd certainly be very very selective on who I gave a no sure. movement clause to. Yeah. What's your take? Uh, so the the wild are kind of in this. Um, they're kind of in the middle, right? And so they're they're definitely too good to be bad. You know, we're still figuring out the playoff situation. Are we good enough to be great? Trade deadlines coming up right here. Um, I bring this up because I looked at Chicago has about a 30% chance to get the number one overall pick. And I'm imagining a world with Connor Bedard and Macklin Celebrini for the next decade in Chicago, which makes me feel sick to my stomach. So do you think the Wild, you just compete 
and like you said, you give the fans their money's worth and eventually it comes home? Or do you need to get bad to get good? Well, and that's you, you, you nailed it. I don't know. Which. You nailed it both places where I'm going to go. First of all, uh, Chicago might have 30% chance, but remember, just very few short years ago, New York was 11th and 12th and won the first pick twice, first and then second pick. So you could move up and get a good player in, in the lottery. Now, I'm, I hate to tell you this, but I, if you look at it, it's really tough to be in no man's land. And no man's land is usually like from the 10th worst team in the league to the 25, you know, to 25. And the reason why it's bad is because just what you said, you don't really get the top players unless you're lucky somebody slips all the way through, which happens, but not as often. So you're not getting as high a draft pick. And your players, when you're down in 10 versus 26, aren't as valuable in the trade. In other words, if you look at all the yeah. teams that had Stanley Cup winning teams and had maybe a little two, three-year run, they always had a core of players, but there was a lot of interchangeables on that squad. And their value is higher because they're on a Stanley Cup team. So you could trade your 11th and 12th guy for more value than he should be getting because they assume he's better because he's on that Winner. team. Yeah. So you're not able to do those things. So unfortunately, yeah, a lot of th most times you got to be bad before you're good. If you look at all the Stanley Cup winning teams, they were bad for two, three years, four years, and, and that's it. Now, will the fans take that? In some places, most of the places they take it, if they like hockey in their big cities, they have enough people to buy the tickets. But, you know, some fans don't want to watch losing teams or teams that... that uh, are it's almost against players. our it's, it's, it identity. Is. So you know. I, I have to tell you, as, as a general manager, I can control where we're going to end up when you get late in the year like that. Because I had a couple of occasions where... We are near the bottom. If I make a trade, we might be able to make the playoffs. But if I don't make a trade, then we're going to have a high pick. In my last year, I, I'll tell you this right now, we, we had a lot of years of injuries. That year, we had over 500-man games missed, and we were four points out of a playoff position. I went to see, Scout says, you got to see Madonna and Linda. And I went, I went out there, and I came back, and our owner, Gordon Gunn, says, well, what do you think? I said, well, I'll tell you this. It's February. We're... Four points out of a playoff position. I can try and make some deals. We might make the playoffs. If we make the playoffs, we're going to be the last team in the playoffs, which means we're going to be picking seventh in the draft. And if we don't make the playoffs, we're going to be first. Now, I said, we're not drawn as well as we should have. I saw a kid that I think is going to be a franchise player in this Madonna. And I, I think that uh, I shouldn't make any deals. And I said, I can take the heat, don't worry about that. I said, but I think for this franchise, we're better off not making a move to try and make a playoff. I said, what do you want to do? He says, do what you think is best for me. I said, well, you're getting Madonna. And that's what we did. Worked out. It worked out. Yeah, he, th <laughs> thanks for that, by the yeah. way. Stallion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Uh, a little more on the wild, too. Or actually, I, I want to pivot to a story that I heard. Uh, Frankie Musil, is that the name? Yeah. Yeah, can you tell us the story uh, on him? And because I, I I hear it's a it's kind of a crazy story how you were able to procure him. Yeah, it is crazy. Well, I, we drafted uh, Franasek, and uh, I want to say around 80, 82, 83, and and uh, he was playing with the Czech national team, and and that time you know you couldn't get Russians and Czechs, and but. If you remember, Quebec was playing in the league at that time. They had the three Stashny brothers that defected. And so I drafted Musil hoping that I could get him to defect. And I, uh, there was a guy called Louis Cotone, and he lived in Toronto from Czechoslovakia. He had a little restaurant. He had the credit for getting the Stashny's out. So I went and I signed a contract with him to... I'd give him $250,000 we would pay him to get Musil out. So you paid an individual, like a third party, to get him out. Yeah, but I didn't pay him the 20. I contract for 250 if he got him out, but I gave him 25000 up front that he could use for travel expenses. So I waited uh, two years, three years, and he, he was, I was, yeah, I talked to him, he's coming, he's coming. Well, so it was Christmas, but who's going to get there faster? <laughs> it was Christmas all the time. 
So I started going on my own, and I went to World Championships in uh, 86, I think it was. And and uh, it was in, in Munich. And I thought I had him. I was going to take him right from the building to the airport and, and get him out. And then he changed his mind. He didn't do it. So in 80, I think it was 87, I'm, I'm sitting in my office in July, and I get a phone call from Rich Winters, who was his agent. And he says, Franasek is ready to defect. I said, great, where is he? He said, Umag, uh, Slovakia. So what are you doing? He's like, doing there. He says, on vacation, and I'm with him, and there's no, we don't see any, you know, uh, authorities around that are, are watching him. I said, I'll be there tomorrow. I'll, I'll catch a flight right, right now, right tonight. So I go out to sign up for a flight, and who, who's there is uh, uh, Bob Bruce, and he hears, and he's working for Channel 5, and he hears me talking oh, to my no. assistant, doors open. Oh, yes, fortunately. I thought, oh, no, at first. Okay. <laughs> and and I, I come out, and I said to my assistant, Sue Thomas, get me a ticket right now to Trieste tonight, Italy, because Trieste is right in the Italian border. It used to be Slovakia, and, you know, about an hour and a half to our drive up from Umag. So he says, I'm coming. I said, no, you're not. He said, I'm coming. I'll stay out of the way. i got to film this. And, and so he went to KSTP. Rob Lear was the head guy, but uh, I guess Stanley Hubbard wanted him to stay back. So Bruce did come, and he came with the cameraman. So th- we get there, and, uh, and that afternoon, and I said, we're going to, I rented a, a Taurus car, and I said, okay, we're going to take a dry run down because I'm going to have to put him in the trunk and get him across the border. <laughs> so we go down to Umog, and, and he's not there, but I told him to meet us the next day at Zagreb at the U.S. consulate. So I come back, and I stop, and, and the, the Yugoslav uh, guards, you know, come all around with machine guns and that, and I'm giving him U.S. pins and trying to be nice and just talking, no, 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 get, get in the car, and... I'm looking, and then 50 yards past is the Italian border, and the guy's sort of sleeping in the, in the, in, in the you know, box there. I'm thinking, okay, so I'm going to come, and just I'm going to have to gun it and go right through before <laughs> they shoot, right? So that's what I'm going to do. So the next day, go down to, I get down to Zagreb, and I go to the U.S. Consulate, and I walk up, and there's a Marine behind a bulletproof glass there, and I said, hi, I'm Lou Nanny from the Minnesota North Stars. I'm here to pick up Frenesic Musil. He who's he, well, he's the check that's defecting. I don't know anything about it. I said, well, he's here. I know because I talked to him. I talked to his agent last night. Can't help you. I said, call the counselor upstairs. He must know. So he calls. He puts me in the phone with him. And I said, I'm Lou Nanny. I'm here to pick up Musil. He says, he's not here. We sent him to Belgrade. He says, Belgrade? If he gets to Belgrade, I said, once he signs in there, there's this reclamation or something that he has to spend two years there. I'll never get him out of there for two years. And he said, well, I can't help you. I said, you can't help me? I said, well, you got to come downstairs and right now. He said, why? I said, I got an ABC cameraman here, and we're going to put you on and just say you won't help a U.S. citizen in a communist country. Okay, settle down, settle down. So he came down, and he said, what do you want me to do? I said, well, I want you to call Belgrade right now, and don't let him register, which he did. And I said, I, I, I got to get him out of here. He said, how are you going to do it? I said, I'm going to put him in a trunk. And I'm going right through. He said, you Nazis, He said, you can't do that. I said, well, I got no other choice. He said, yes, you do. I said, what? He said, do you know uh, a U.S. senator? I said, yeah. He said, get the senator to give you uh, this fax that, you know, you're allowing it, but you're going to have to have your, uh, your assistant go down to the immigration and, and show proof of a contract. So give me your phone. So I picked up the phone. I called Dave Durenberger, Senator Durenberger, and he was in his office in Washington. I said, Dave, I need this right now. <laughs> so he sent a fax over to the U.S. consulate. Then I picked up my phone. I called Sue Thomas. She went down to the U.S. immigration. I said, give him a $250,000 signing bonus, and here's a standard contract because I was going to pay that to Katona. And, uh, and we get him out. So uh, she did that. And he, I said, now what? He says, well... He says, tomorrow morning, you got to get a, 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 a pass, a visa to get out of here. And I, how do I do that? Just take them, get a picture and, and uh, a visa on it, and we'll put you on a plane at 1 o'clock to London. I says, good. So I, he gets in around midnight, and I, I take him the next morning and uh, got the passport. Now I got that car, the Taurus car. What am I going to do with my car? So I walked over and drove over to Hertz. I said, 
you take rental cars? And, and he said, well, no, not from Italy. I said, well, here's the keys. I don't care if I own it. They're $8,000 at that time. I figure I can buy the car, you know, give it to the North Stars. They can donate or whatever, but I, I got to get out of the country. Right, right, right. I got to go. So they they took it, and I only got a $467 drop charge for us. From So they took the car. We land in London. Now, they won't let him off the plane in London because he hasn't got a visa to be in London. So I so said, well, what do you want me to do? He says, go get two tickets on the next plane out of town and uh, get him out of here. So I went upstairs. The Concorde was leaving in about an hour and a half. So I got two tickets on the Concorde. We flew, got into New York. FBI was waiting for us, and, and they just didn't even take us through customs, took us over to a limo to take us uh, to LaGuardia and get us home. No way. Yeah. God, may, maybe it should be Matt Damon instead of Brett. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? I think right. that was like the he's born, the, the born the, identity, the born nanny. Yeah. yeah, no kidding. That is unbelievable. But that's a, it's a so you, you must have a relationship with Lou Lamarillo because there was a similar Very, a long, long time. Yeah, a similar story with uh, Stasny, I believe, in Russia and different things, right? Or getting the guys over, or them having to communicate with them and the challenges to to get these guys to come overseas and play. Yeah, well, Louis didn't get in. They they the Stasny's played up in. in Quebec, and uh, that's way back when Maurice Chevy and Maurice uh, Fillion was the general manager. Oh, maybe it was. So Lou, Lou had one with a, a Russian player. A Russian. Yeah. And I had a Russian. I, I, I was working in Balderas for a long time. I used to, every time he'd come to town, I'd send Doc Nagabots over to meet the team and bring him blankets and stuff like that. We, after I was general manager and when I was president, then we, we got Balderas over. But I drafted the first Russian, even before he was zooked off or something. He never came over. But they got fierce, you know, Fedosov was out and... and uh, Maybe that's who it was for TC. Yeah, that's who we got out, yeah. yeah. And and they started dealing with them. Uh, at least then the Russians were agreeable to doing some, but they had, like, Bury defected. Uh, Vancouver got him. Uh, mm -hmm. It was uh, um, a kid from Detroit, too. It starts with Larryanoff. Larry Larryanoff did, did, too, but then another Fedorov. one. Fedorov. Fedorov. Yeah. I mean, so they, they, were, they started defecting after that, and, and that's why the Russians uh, almost quit coming over to play because... <laughs> Guys were just waiting to get over here. Once they get over here, then they'd scatter. Um, before we get you out of here, we know you're busy, and thanks so much for, for stopping by and giving us the time. Uh, but the trade deadline's coming up. Um, you've sat in that chair of a general manager before. Um, what's, the, what's the anatomy of a trade deadline? Like, wh how does it go? Just everybody calls everybody, what do you got? Uh, are you working people? Like, it's just, it's just so fascinating to me to, to try to figure out how these deals go down and what the day is like. Well, I'm sure it's changed because of the salary cap from when I was there. I used to call people every day, so what's, who's getting traded? I'd like to know in the league. I'd, I'd call, you got anything you're trying to move, uh, anything you're looking for? I try to keep a pulse in the whole league all the time so I wouldn't be surprised by it or if I had to try and kill a deal or – Call somebody say, he, he's getting this guy and he's terrible or something. You, know, <laughs> you got to spread bad rumors, whatever you do. But now with the, you trade uh, with the salary cap, they don't trade as much. But now it'll be hectic then because then people will be looking to get additions that might really help them in the run and people will be looking to sell because the, the philosophy should be you never want to have somebody in their last contract. You don't like the – which now they can do more because of free agency. But – you never like to lose an asset value for nothing. Right. And so if somebody's going to leave you at the end of the year, you might as well get rid of them now. If right. you can you pick up, uh, you know, dirty laundry, whatever it is, <laughs> but get something if you can. Yeah, there's a lot of noise on Duhame on the Internet anyway. You know? He'll be gone from what I hear, and that's because he's going to want a lot of money and, and while they're in a position to give it to him. And so he's a valuable commodity. I'd love that kid. I wish they'd oh, keep him on the team. But, but if he's not going to be here... Don't let them wait till the end of the year. Move them. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. It's all gonna. It's all gonna shake out. I. Uh, I. I did a little intel on you as we round wound down here. So I was told to ask about your superstitions and your sneezing by someone that knows you well. What What does that mean? So they're like, it's crazy. Ask him about his superstitions and his sneezing. I can't tell you who gave me that information. Yeah, I can guess. Because uh, <laughs> you're, you're a, you're a tight-knit family. Well, so. when I get sneezing quick, when I start sneezing, I'll sneeze up to 12 times. Usually. Is it always? So I have a buddy. It's usually, always yeah, I mean, 11 times. Do you have a number? 
No, it was 12. But I, Always 12? No, I don't know. I, I've been getting less now. I've been getting seven oh, nice eight, work. you know, which is good. But it, it happens a lot of times after meals, and people say it's the wine. I said, I don't drink bre- wine for breakfast, so it's not the wine. You You're know? not looking at the sun, are you? No, I'm, I'm inside a restaurant. I just, I start and I can't stop. But... And what are your superstitions? Superstitions are what really drove me out of hockey. It's not superstitions. <laughs> it's OCD. I thought I was superstitious. Okay. Until I got a call from Oprah Winfrey's office and asked me to go on the show and talk about superstition. I got there watching the show, and then I found out it's obsessive-compulsive. And and they just manufacture and grow over the time when, when you're in a position like I was. For instance, if I'm sitting like this and we score a goal, I would sit like this. And might, if it's three periods, I, I'd say three periods. If, if they scored, then I may I could get my hands off. And, I, wow. and that started, you know, like I'd go around the chairs four times this way and four times that way, and the other team scored, then i go two times this way, two times that way. And I have so many of these, I can't even tell you what happens. And and they just kept building. I, I thought it was just superstitious, you know, when you start. And Esposito and I used to be in a locker room, and don't do that and don't do this, or I always put my right leg first. And yeah. my left leg, and then I wouldn't tie my skates till Oliver tied his skates, and then when he noticed it before a game, he'd sort of pretend to go down, I'd go down, and he'd pull back up, <laughs> and he's down there, and he, he wouldn't even look at me, you know, and then you start doing these crazy things. But you broke out of it. You're kind of done uh, with no, it. No, I didn't. That's why I quit. I haven't, uh, but I I don't do it as much, but I, my wife says, you're going to stop that crazy stuff now? I said, <laughs> I am, but I reserve the right to revert. Yeah. So when it gets in a close game in the wild and I'm doing this stuff, yeah. even when I'm watching, she's, you're doing it again or I'll change the channel. You know, if the other team scores in a while, I'll change the channel, change it back. i got to change your luck. Yeah, yeah change it up. I thought you were going to quit that. I said, I, I have quit it until tonight. Yeah. <laughs> just, that's I all. used to change the channel out of luck. Now I do it because I just want to see what else. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see what channel I was on. I can't remember. <laughs> Uh, the hole in one. Can we give it? Can we end with that? Maybe I. I love that all these like dictators all over the world. They put out this information about what their life is like, and it's nonsense. You actually live the life of the <laughs> fake dictator. So you had another hole in one yeah. at eighty two. Tell tell us about that. Well, the wind was from thirty two degrees northeast, <laughs> sixteen foot grade. I was playing the tournament at, at the Floridian oh, in the snow, and uh, it was uh, one hundred twenty six yard par three, and the guy had just put. My opponent just put one three feet in front of us. My partner says, put it inside. But there's the superstition again. So I hit it. I look, and it's going. It's a good shot. It's in there. It's going in. So I was reaching down to get my tee, and he said it's going in. So now I can't look because they're going to oh, change no. the luck. No, so I didn't even look. So I'm holding. It's going. It's going. It's getting in. And, and I'm just keeping my hand on the tee in the air like this, waiting until they said it's in. Then they said it's in. Hey. No so, way. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even see. So now he'll in. never watch another tee shot the rest no, of his life. No, no. Yeah. I, I will if I if I am changing, but I couldn't change from there. So I. Oh, my goodness. But the best part is we played the same hole the next day, and my opponents that day, one of those guys got a hole in one. Oh, man. And that's a, like a hundred million chance to get. Two hole in ones in the same hole, back to back days with same two of the same people yeah. in the hole. It just <laughs> doesn't happen. No, it's crazy. So what? How was the bar after? What did everybody order? Hey, I was lucky. It was a tournament. And all the drinks were free, so I didn't have to buy anything. <laughs> <laughs> you really got out of it. Yes, I did. <laughs> So now you got to go back and play that course on that day, every yeah, day, yeah, every yeah, year, during the yeah. tournament. And <laughs> no, because I already got the hole in one. I don't want. I don't want another one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have anything? I uh, left. No, I'm good. I mean, I'm just grateful for the time. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, thanks uh, from the state of hockey for 60 years of doing the tournament. Obviously, all the North Star stuff, and uh, you know, you're a legend. You're the Godfather. So I really appreciate uh, everything you've given to us. I know even this week you're going to get pulled in every different direction. You'll be on a beach before you know it. But thanks for everything you've yeah. given to hockey fans and families here in the state of hockey. Well, thank you guys for and thank you for what you do because it. Certainly is entertaining, and uh, guys like me to have to fill up time. Really enjoy filling it up listening to this. So well, good. you're that, always welcome. We'll smoke a cigar together good. someday. That sounds good. I'm, I'm anxious to do that. <laughs> that reminds me just one more question. How in the heck does a Canadian guy, uh, Italian, um, turn into, like, the, the icon of Minnesota hockey? Like, how, how did that Well, happen? because a, a, an Italian guy, John Mariucci, recruited me here, and when he recruited me, I didn't know where Minnesota was, and I got here. And he said to me, you come here, you'll never leave. And he was right. And, and, and I became, we became very close. He was like yeah. my second father. When I w- wanted to get married, my wife needed a visa. And, and uh, 
he he was there, he stood up for her. So before the games, it was funny because I, you know, I'd walk in with my wife going to the Gopher game. She'd be coming early, and he'd be standing in the lobby, and he'd come over and say, "Remember, Francine, he doesn't play good. You go home." Yeah. <laughs> so I I don't know, and he just he used to take me all around, and and as I said, when I didn't turn pro right away, he had me as freshman coach, and he would take me to. He'd do 50, 70 speeches a year to sell the game throughout the, yeah. throughout the state. And he said, Louis, he said, I got nothing against Canadians, but I want them to come here and compete at the same age. Right now they're coming down to college, you're 23, 25, and you're 18. The, my other guys are 18. I want the same thing to happen. And he says, if the American boy gets a chance, you watch how good they're going to be. And he was right. He's the guy that really... Not only in the state of Minnesota, he made the big difference in the United States on kids getting the opportunity to play hockey. And this guy was like an evangelist, and, and I just wanted to do what he did yeah. because it was so good for, for the kids, for the state, you know, and for hockey. I just uh, I believed what, what he told me, and he, and he was right. Well, I tell you what, it's, uh, of all your accomplishments, being adopted as hashtag one of us yeah. might, be, the mo- <laughs> might yeah. be one of the most impressive. Yeah. Not easy. No, it's yeah. not easy. Yeah. But, uh, enjoy the weekend. Can't wait to, to watch you and the, the State High School Hockey Tournament. Appreciate the time. And, um, yeah, thanks for stopping by. Well, thanks, guys. Appreciate being here. Peace.